Now celebrating our 22nd year of service to the amateur radio community worldwide, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1145 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The Amateur Radio on the International Space Station team and its partners are investigating just what is keeping the ham radio station on the ISS off the air. The ARRL Board of Directors reconsiders the use of electronic balloting and confers many 2021 awards. We will have all the details on both of those stories. ARIS is seeking to schedule hosts for ham radio contacts with the space station during 2022. The International Amateur Radio Union receives a donation of a brand new domain name. We will have all the details. Plans to retrieve the wireless equipment aboard the Titanic is put on indefinite hold. SpaceX launches a bunch of new amateur radio satellites for France. We will tell you all about them. A Canadian amateur radio club is offering up its brand new microwave network for emergency communications across British Columbia. And... Amateur radio comes to the forefront again as amateurs in India assist in identifying a missing Australian citizen. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get a report from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites orbiting the planet. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will talk about how technology and social media caused a little bit of a problem on the stock market last week. Australia's own Anna Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will tell us about the changing of the guard. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week's edition is entitled Hams vs. the ARRL and will relate the story of the introduction and reaction to incentive licensing. And our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will have his fifth installment of writing a successful public service announcement to promote your amateur radio club's activities on local broadcast radio stations. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in the calm before the storm, Albany, New York, I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from Ice Station Zebra, again atop the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, where we're bracing once again this weekend for a uh, veritable big load of snow. I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, where the weather is warming up a bit, I'm Fred Fitty, November Fox 2 Fox. And reporting from our News Bureau, in an easily snowshoeable Troy, New York, I'm Eric Sattel, Kilo Delta 2, Romeo Juliet X-Ray. And reporting from our News Bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where we may be getting some weather we can shovel, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now with our lead story, here is Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. Dave? Our lead story this week is in orbit. Amateur radio on the International Space Station and its partners are troubleshooting what's keeping the NA1SS amateur station off the air. Eris became aware of the problem as students at Newcastle High School in Wyoming waited for their chance for radio contact with the ISS. Jan, ON7UX, the Telebridge station in Belgium, called as ON4ISS as the spacecraft came up on his horizon, but only noise came back. Several minutes passed as Jan kept trying, still nothing. Science teacher Jim Stith, KI7URL, had helped prep the students on radio protocol in anticipation of their questions to Mike Hopkins, KF5LJG. Ultimately, however, that contact never happened. ARIS Executive Director Frank Bauer, KA3HDO, said in a press release later that a technical problem had apparently taken the ISS radio out of service. He said additional troubleshooting was needed, 
but possibilities point to trouble with a new external RF cable recently installed or related to the interior coax cable. The press release said that NASA has opened a payload anomaly report for the issue. ARIS has determined that the problem is not with the radio equipment on board the ISS Columbus module. This week was a tough one for ARIS. ARIS International Chair Frank Bauer, KA3HDO, began in a message on January 28th to the ARIS team. Bauer explained that during a January 27th spacewalk to install exterior cabling on the ISS Columbus module, the current coax feed line installed 11 years ago was replaced with another built by the European Space Agency and Airbus. It included two additional RF connectors to support the commissioning of the Bartolomeo payload hosting platform installed last spring on Columbus. On January 26th, prior to the extravehicular activity, our Columbus Next Generation radio system was shut off and the ISS internal coaxial cable to the antenna was disconnected from the ARIS radio as a safety precaution for the EVA, Bauer said. During the spacewalk, an external four-connector coax feed line replaced one with two RF connections. This change was made to allow European Space Agency to connect ARIS and three additional customers to Bartolomeo as compared to ARIS and one additional RF customer, Bauer explained. With the spacewalk completed, the ISS crew restarted the ISS ham radio station on January 28th, but no voice repeater or automatic packet repeater system downlink reports were heard. During a scheduled school contact at 1746 UTC, no downlink signal was heard either, and the attempted contact had to be terminated. Clearly, there is an issue, Bauer continued. More troubleshooting will be required. It may be the new external RF cable that was installed during yesterday's EVA. It might also have been caused by the connect and disconnect of the interior coaxial RF cable. So, the interior cable cannot be totally discounted yet. Bauer said the crew photographed the coaxial cable and connector attached to the ARIS radio inside the ISS. Because the exterior cable is a Bartolomeo cable and not an ARIS cable, we are working with the ESA and NASA on a way forward, he said. We have talked to both the NASA and European Space Agency representatives. Bauer said ARIS has asked its Russian team lead, Sergei Sambarov, RV3DR, if ARIS could temporarily use the RS0ISS radio in the ISS service module for school contacts that are already scheduled until ARIS can resolve the issue. On behalf of the ARIS International Board, the ARIS delegates, and the entire team, I want to thank all of you for your tremendous volunteer support to ARIS, Bauer said. We will get through this and be more resilient as a result. Now celebrating our 22nd year keeping the amateur radio community informed, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available worldwide as a podcast from our web at www.twiar.net. During its annual meeting on January 14th and 15th, the ARRL Board of Directors announced recipients of the ARRL Knight Distinguished Service Award and 2020 Bill Leonard Social Media Award. The board also recognized several ARRL affiliated clubs. With more details on who received the awards this year, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from League Headquarters in Newington. ARRL Minnesota Section Manager Skip Jackson, KS0J, is the recipient of the ARRL Knight Distinguished Service Award, which goes to a section manager. The board recognized Jackson's 16 years as SM, actively promoting ARRL activities in his section, and it credits Jackson's leadership for developing a strong working cadre of volunteers in the section. The board called him a model to ARRL section managers as a strong supporter of the league and its activities. The award's namesake is longtime veteran New Mexico section manager Joe T. Wright, W5PDY, now SK, who was the first recipient of the award in 2003. 
The board also approved Josh Nass, KI6NAZ, as the winner of the 2020 Bill Leonard Professional Media Award for video reporting. The board cited Nass for his outstanding YouTube channel, Ham Radio Crash Course, which has garnered almost 170,000 subscribers. The board resolution observed that generating productions of high levels of content and effective and entertaining instruction of that content, all while maintaining rigorous technical standards, demands consistent discipline and rigor. The resolution also cited NAS for his use of new modes of learning and information conveyance that enhance further education of amateur radio operators everywhere. The Leonard Award includes a $250 honorarium and a plaque. The board approved the change to the timing of the Philip J. McGann Silver Antenna Award and the Bill Leonard W2SKI Professional Media Award. The nomination deadline for both awards has been changed to March 31st every year. This brings the cycle of the two media awards into alignment with five other prominent ARRL awards. The Hiram Percy Maxim Award, the ARRL Herb S. Breyer Instructor of the Year Award, ARRL Microwave Development Award, the ARRL Technical Service Award, and the ARRL Technical Innovation Award. Nominations for these awards will cover the previous calendar year. The change is effective with the March 31, 2022 application nomination covering the period of January 1 to December 31st. The board also recognized the 70th anniversary of the Garden State Amateur Radio Association, W2GSA. The board resolution cited the club's outstanding record of learning and education programs, including youth programs. In addition, the board honored the 105th anniversary of the Amateur Radio Club of the University of Arkansas, W5YM, formed in 1916. Finally, the board recognized the 50th anniversary of the Boeing Employees Amateur Radio Society, St. Louis, which became an ARRL affiliated club in 1971. The club serves the public and the Boeing community in St. Louis by supporting various needs for radio communications. In times of emergency, requests for support of public service events, development and training in the field of radio communications technologies, the board said. The ARRL Board of Directors will look into the use of electronic balloting systems to augment paper balloting for ARRL elections. With more details on the Board's directive, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from League Headquarters. The Board instituted a hybrid paper and electronic balloting process in the fall of 2012, which was popular among those who took advantage of it, but overall voter participation declined significantly. In 2015, the board's Ethics and Elections Committee decided to return to using solely paper ballots. The e, e Committee said continuing changes in technology, the acceptance of remote meetings, and significant advancements in voting processes since then have made electronic balloting worth a second look. The board directed its Administration and Finance Committee to investigate the state, cost, and availability of commercial electronic balloting services as a member selected alternative to paper ballots distributed and collected via the U.S. Postal Service. The committee will report back to the board within one year. Electronic balloting is now in common use among professional organizations, the board said. Using electronic balloting would be of benefit to members who find paper ballots difficult to use. Providing electronic balloting as an alternative to paper balloting may result in a cost savings to the organization and decrease delays and potential conflicts over delays of paper ballots. It is likely, also, that the use of online balloting will be attractive to younger members who are more accustomed to online transactions. Amateur Radio on the International Space Station is seeking formal and informal educational institutions and organizations, individually or working together, to host amateur radio contacts with the International Space Station crew member. Contacts likely would be scheduled between January 1st and June 30th, 2022. These voice radio contacts are approximately 10 minutes long and in a question and answer format. Aries contacts afford participants the opportunity to learn firsthand what it's like to live and work in space and about space research conducted on the space station. Students will also have an opportunity to learn about satellite communications, wireless technology, and radio science. 
Crew scheduling and ISS orbits will determine the exact dates. ARIS is looking for organizations that can draw large numbers of participants and integrate the contact into a well-developed educational plan. Organizations must demonstrate flexibility to accommodate changes in dates and times of the radio contact. The deadline for proposals is March 31, 2021. Visit the ARIES website for more details and a proposal form. An ARIES introductional webinar will be held February 25, 2021 at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time or 0100 UTC on February 26. Participants must register. Email with any questions. It looks as though Ofcom, the UK regulator, is set on introducing new legislation requiring even the humble radio ham to maintain records of measurements of the electromagnetic fields they are creating with their installations. While Ofcom produced a rather complicated calculator facility, necessarily intended to cover every possible type of radio installation, the RSGB have been taming this with a special front-end input page designed to narrow down the input parameters to those of typical radio amateur stations. Well, I've tried the prototype of the RSGB calculator based on my own modest 100 watt transmitter to a low dipole, and the results are quite interesting. It seems that the electromagnetic field around my aerial is completely safe by the time you get to the boundary of my property, but at ground level, directly beneath the antenna, the field is only just within safe parameters. So I'm currently putting up a sign to ban giraffes from my garden. Anyway, here's more. A revised version of the RSGB Ofcom Electromagnetic Field Calculator was released a few days ago. The revision addresses some font and formatting issues. You may recall that Ofcom have decided to introduce a specific condition in the UK Wireless Telegraphy Act licences, requiring all licensees to comply with the ICN IRP general public limits on EMF exposure. This condition will apply to amateur licences too, and a draft of the proposed regulations has been released as part of Ofcom's second consultation document. The RSGB has submitted its response, including detailed comments and suggested amendments to this second EMF consultation. RSGB and ARRL volunteers are using advanced computer modelling to estimate RF exposure much more accurately in the near field and close to ground, to help assess compliance when the Ofcom calculator is too conservative or may not apply. The RSGB has developed an additional front sheet in the RSGB Ofcom EMF calculator, which is a 3.8 megabytes Microsoft Excel worksheet, to calculate EIRP from practical amateur radio station parameters. The RSGB plans to extend its current guidance on good RF housekeeping for managing EMC issues, to include good practice for compliance with EMF exposure limits. The RSGB also plans additional training and amendments to the amateur examination syllabus. Go to rsgb.org and navigate to the RSGB EMF page, where you'll find much more information and, of course, the EMF calculator itself. You are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a podcast at our website, www.twiar.net, and streamed worldwide via Spotify and iHeartMedia. Andrew J. Wolfram, K17RYC, has donated the hamradio.org domain to the International Amateur Radio Union for non-profit educational use to promote the amateur and amateur satellite services. In accepting this gift, IARU President Tim Allen, VE6SH, said, The hamradio.org domain offers a unique opportunity for which we are deeply grateful to Andrew. It is our intention to develop a website that can serve as a focal point for anyone, anywhere, who may be seeking information on amateur radio, which is better known as ham radio by the general public. The International Amateur Radio Union is the global federation of national amateur radio organizations with member societies in more than 160 countries and separate territories. Since its founding in 1925, the IARU has successfully defended and expanded access to the radio spectrum by radio amateurs internationally. Meanwhile, Word from Ofcom in the UK has clarified some long-standing confusion over licensing responsibilities in the British Antarctic Territory region. Ham seeking new VP8 licenses to operate in the Antarctic and South Georgia have learned they will only be able to use those licenses on the Falkland Islands. 
With more details on this confusing story, we go to Steve Richards, G4HPE, who files this story via the Southgate Vibes News Service. Well, it's all gone slightly wrong down in one of the UK's most distant overseas territories, the Falkland Islands, to the east of Argentina. It seems that the future of the Victor Papa 8 license prefix has been plunged into confusion following a recent change in licensing authority. You may be aware that there have recently been some amateur radio licensing difficulties experienced in the Falkland Islands due to new communications legislation being implemented. This involved all previous and existing VP8 licenses issued under the old Falkland Islands Wireless Telegraphy Act being revoked en masse in early 2020. It included all existing VP8 Antarctic and South Georgia licenses, resulting in no legal amateur radio operation in these overseas territories being permitted under a VP8 call sign. This included all existing VP8 Antarctic and South Georgia licenses, resulting in no legal amateur radio operation in these overseas territories being permitted under a VP8 call sign. Licenses were then revalidated and reissued under the new Falkland Islands Communications Ordinance on a case-by-case -case basis, but for use in the Falkland Islands only. Well, now there's some good news from the UK regulatory body Ofcom concerning the situation. Writing on the webpage Open Falklands, Chris, Golf 3 Whiskey Oscar Sierra and Alan, Golf 4 Echo Echo Lima, said that in the summer of 2020, they had to resort to legal action as non-residents to get their VP8 licenses restored. However, when their licenses were restored, the VP8 Antarctic and South Georgia license elements were seemingly overlooked and were reissued as valid for use in the Falkland Islands only. The previous communications regulator stopped issuing VP8 licenses for use in British Antarctic Territory and the South Georgia and South Sandwich Islands in mid-2017, apparently on the grounds that they're no longer Falkland Islands dependencies. Well, at first this was thought that this was simply the result of an administrative oversight due to a lack of knowledge of amateur radio and that the matter would be quickly rectified. However, the Falkland Islands communication regulator continues with this policy. Indeed, it has been explicitly stated that the VP8 prefix can only be used within the Falkland Islands themselves. Therefore, as things stand, stations operating with a VP8 call sign from the Antarctic or South Georgia have not been legitimate since early 2020 and continue to be so. Chris and Alan referred the situation to Ofcom, who replied by saying that while neither South Georgia and the South Sandwich Islands nor the British Antarctic Territory currently have the legislative power to issue call signs, when they have, Ofcom can agree an allocation with them. Until then, call signs with the prefix Victor Papa 8 will continue to identify existing stations in those British overseas territories. Alan and Chris said that there was still much work to do as Ofcom responses so far do not address the critical issue of providing new VP8 licenses for use in the British Antarctic Territory and South Georgia and South Sandwich Islands. So they will continue this work to get the situation resolved. For full details, read their information at www.openfalklands.com. Ofcom noted that the British Atlantic Territories, South Georgia, and South Sandwich Islands cannot issue their own licenses or assign call signs. Ofcom left the option open for those locales to ask the Falkland Islands to administer licensing and call signs on their behalf, as had been the case up until early 2020. RMS Titanic Incorporated, or RMST, the company that owns salvage rights to the Titanic shipwreck, has indefinitely put off its plans to retrieve the vessel's radio equipment for exhibit. Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, has more on this story from League Headquarters. RMS Titanic Incorporated, RMST, the company that owns salvage rights to the Titanic shipwreck, has indefinitely put off its plans to retrieve the vessel's radio equipment for exhibit. The company cited the coronavirus pandemic for the delay, according to a January 29th court filing. The Atlanta-based company said its plans have faced increasing difficulty associated with international travel and logistics and the associated health risks to the expedition team. RMST's primary source of revenue is from its exhibits of its vast collection of Titanic relics, 
which have been closed or seen only limited attendance due to virus-related restrictions. RMST said its planned expedition to recover the ship's wireless station equipment remains a top priority and will take place as soon as reasonably practicable. The Marconi-equipped station transmitted the distress calls after the Titanic, on its maiden voyage, struck an iceberg some 370 miles off the coast of Newfoundland in 1912 and began sinking. The transmissions, heard by some nearby vessels, have been credited with helping to rescue some 700 passengers, but about 1,500 passengers perished. Titanic Incorporated has said the radio transmitter could unlock some of the secrets about a missed warning message and distress calls sent from the ship. The coronavirus pandemic aside, RMST has been in an ongoing legal battle with the U.S. government over whether the recovery operation would be legal. In May of 2020, a U.S. federal judge in Virginia gave permission to retrieve the ill-fated ship's wireless gear. The judge ruled that the radio gear has significant historical, educational, scientific, and cultural value and could soon be lost within the rapidly decaying wreck and said the company would be permitted minimally to cut into the wreck to access the radio room. RMST has said it would try to avoid cutting into the ship, noting that the radio room may be reachable via an already open skylight. But the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has contended that the retrieval expedition is still prohibited under U.S. law, and under an international agreement between the U.S. and the U.K. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has argued that any benefit to be realized from cutting into the vessel to recover the Marconi equipment would not be worth the cost to the resource and not in the public interest. RMST sought permission to carry out what it called a surgical removal and retrieval of the Marconi radio equipment, which is in poor shape after more than a century underwater. The undersea retrieval would mark the first time an artifact was collected from within the Titanic, which many believe should remain undisturbed as the final resting place of the victims of the maritime disaster. The wreck sits on the ocean floor some two and a half miles beneath the surface and remained undiscovered until 1985. RMST plans to use a manned submarine to reach the wreck and would then deploy a remotely controlled submarine to retrieve the radio equipment. Originating from Albany, New York and distributed worldwide, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California, This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Uh, welcome. Good to see you. What's going on? in the stock market this week because it's i think it's fascinating it's an example of how the internet and in particular the ability the internet has and social media has to organize large numbers of people to do something in concert you know three weeks ago it was attacked the capitol building this week it was attack <laughs> the hedge funds the wall street traders and in both cases chaos ensued but from the point of view of people on uh, the Reddit forum, Wall Street Bets, good chaos. It's like good trouble. Good chaos ensued. So what are we talking about? Now you, you, I'm sure you, you heard all that, and I'm not going to do what I think probably everybody and their brother's doing, explaining what shorts <laughs> are and options and calls and puts and longs and how the stock market works. I don't need to do that. Suffice to say... Uh, you know about, there's a little storefront, you probably see it in your local mall, called GameStop. GameStop is where my kids used to go to buy video games. You know, because in back in the day, just like you had to go to the record store to buy records and the CD store to buy CDs, to buy games, you had to go to the game store. In most cases, this was GameStop, and you'd buy a thing it kind of looked like a dvd plastic cover you remember these with a cd or dvd inside and you'd stick it in your game machine you'd play the game but uh lately malls have been kind of suffering <laughs> not just from the pandemic even before but the pandemic didn't help and to top that off digital downloads started to replace physical 
for not just records and CDs and all of that stuff, but for uh, games. Nowadays, you don't go to the game store to buy a game. You just buy it on your Xbox or your PlayStation and downloads and you're done. My 18-year-old still likes to have physical media, but he's kind of, he's kind of an old-fashioned 18-year-old. You know, the main reason for that is he, after he's done with the game, board with the game, he can sell it at GameStop as used and get some of his money back and credit to buy a new game. So there is that. But for a long time, the future of GameSpot didn't look all that good. In fact, they've been through, uh, what is it, four or five CEOs in the last 12 months. That's always a bad sign. Always a bad sign. Their stock's been going down, you know. It's, you know, that's you look at a stock like that, you go, it doesn't have a lot of future. And apparently that's what Wall Street did. Uh, Wall Street bet against GameSpot's stock. They call that going short, where you, where you buy, actually borrow a bunch of stock and sell it at a high, at the current price, figuring in next week or next month, that price is going to go in half. You can then buy the stock at, at that lower price, repay the, the borrow, and you'll have made money. And it's, you know, uh, it's it's something uh, people do to hedge their bets in the stock market. That's called going short. There's going long, which is what everybody usually does. You buy low and, and hopefully you sell high and you make a little money in the stock market. This is buying high or borrowing high, selling low and making a little money in the stock market. And hedge funds do this to hedge their bets. Hedge funds are set up for the very wealthy to protect themselves against sudden drops in the stock market. And what do they look for? They look for stocks that don't look too promising. GameStop is one. AMC, the movie theater chain, practically bankrupt, that's another. But that doesn't take into account <laughs> the amateurs. You know, when you play poker, I'm told, I'm not a good poker player, but you can play poker. You like to play people who know what they're doing because you can kind of predict, you know, that guy uh, likes to bet a weak hand, that guy never bluffs. You know, you kind of get to know what they're doing. The thing that really is hard to play against is somebody who's so bad, such a terrible poker player, that they're unpredictable. They, their strategy changes from one hand to the other. Sometimes they'll bet, sometimes they won't. And so it's hard to read them, right? It's the same in the stock market. The pros, the people who do this all the time, you know, there's certain rules they follow. There's certain behavioral things they expect. They never thought that Reddit would come along. <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> You know, there, there is a lot of is, is in common with a lot of other things that have happened in social media. You probably have noticed this. I certainly have. The, the mobs form on social media, don't they? Social media has, has enabled this kind of mob mentality, this ability for people of like mind to get together and then act together. And that's the power of it. You know, any individual who has a crazy belief the world is flat by his or herself doesn't they don't have any power the world's flat probably go down to you know the town square and have a sign the world is flat big deal but you get 5000 of them together on reddit or twitter or facebook suddenly there's some power and the fact that there's 5000 in the whole world people who believe the world's flat convinces more thousands of people to go well maybe there's something to that and you could see the snowball effect We've seen this happen many times now, and this is the most recent. I think it's fascinating. There is a little bit of a, a rebellion going on, too, because the people on Reddit, A, I think that they probably knew that GameStop wasn't going to be a big stock. It's what I guess we're calling now, we're calling it a meme stock. It's not necessarily there's value in GameStop. By the way, GameStop gains nothing from all of this ferment, except maybe some news <laughs> some column inches in the newspaper but otherwise the money doesn't go to GameStop it goes to other stockholders here's the problem everybody in you know the normal financial circles the wise men all said oh this, this is a dog of a stock we're gonna short it they shorted it they borrowed so much they borrowed 140 percent of the total value of GameStop they borrowed more stock than exists that put them in a kind of a bind because when Folks at Reddit decided, and we're not sure exactly, by the way, who's behind this and 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 how it happened. But what's it's, it's and so I, I'm not interested in the stock market per se, but I'm interested in how social media can be used to create movements. This movement got created. Perhaps it was let's stick it to the shorts, let's 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 hurt the big Wall Street hedge funds. Perhaps they actually thought there was value in it. 
you know, there was some evidence that maybe GameStop had a future. There was a guy, uh, the guy who started Chewy, the online pet store, Ryan Cohen, who bought a lot of GameSpot, uh, GameStop stock, stock in uh, in uh, last fall. Because he was he had a seat on the board. He, I think he had 13% of it by the end of last year. And this guy's considered a smart investor, and people probably saw that too. And he got a seat on the board. He's going to convince GameStop to start going digital, you know, maybe find a new life. So that could be also the people on this Reddit forum, Wall Street Bets, said, you know, maybe there's something. Maybe they, maybe they really thought this was a good buy. Maybe they wanted to stick it to the hedge funds. Maybe it was just one of those things that everybody got in for the lulls. You've heard that phrase for the lulls? It comes from LOL, laugh out loud. Not little old lady, laugh out loud. Not love you lots. LOL means laugh out loud. And the lulls, the L-O-L-S or L-U-L-Z, as it finally came to be spelled, is, you know, we're just doing it for the fun of it. Eh, I'm going to buy 10 bucks worth of GameStop or 100 bucks. Some of this was facilitated by the f apps like Webull and probably you've heard of Robinhood. These were apps that let people buy stocks with no commission. It made it very easy, in fact, to go short on a stock, to go long on a stock. You just download the app. Easy peasy. Uh, there's a long story about game, about Robinhood and why this is a terrible thing to use for your stock purchases, but we'll save that for another day. <laughs> that, that is part of the factor, though, is is uh, the, the Internet <laughs> startups, the unicorns seeing an opportunity and jumping on it, which is what Robinhood did. And so they kind of they got their share of the pie. The only people who really got hurt were the hedge funds who had so over borrowed for this stock that suddenly they had to they had to sell them rather buy they had to buy to repay their borrowing they had to buy stock at a much higher price they lost their shirts in fact some of them almost went bankrupt billions of dollars billions of dollars billions of dollars melvin capital citron capital these are all big hedge funds and they were the term is they were squeezed they spread it squeezed the shorts then Robinhood stepped in and the stock market stepped in. And this is where the rebellion says eh, to protect the rich people and stopped trading. Robinhood said, no, you can't sell more than one share. They can't take advantage of this. People got very upset, very, very upset. And I think if you're watching on the sidelines, perhaps you're saying, oh, look, people are making money, lots of it on this GameStop game stop stock. It's hard to say. <laughs> or and by the way, it's now gone past GameStop. It's it's uh, AMC, as I mentioned, the theater chain. It's Nokia. All of these are kind of undervalued or perhaps stocks on the way down that, that there are a lot of shorts in the market. Even a, 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 a cryptocurrency that is, is itself a mean cryptocurrency. It's called Dogecoin, named after that dog. You've seen the Doge that says funny things. It, it literally is a meme. Somebody created a, a cryptocurrency some years back. That's going through the roof. <laughs> And part of me thinks this is just, uh, you know, the, on the surface reading of it is, is just little guys going, yeah, take that, Wall Street. Ha ha. And certainly some of it is that. Gotcha. Gotcha. They're not even maybe trying to make money. I think some are, but maybe not even that. Maybe you're saying, let's just stick it to the hedge funds. But it might be more complicated because it's very hard to see who's moving this. And it could be. Some have proposed it's not just the little guys, maybe not at all the little guys. It's other hedge funds who aren't short on these stocks trying to put their competitors out of business. And there's even those who say it's Russia or it's China. <laughs> it's certainly rattling a lot of people. Look, the financial part of it is less interesting to me than what is, I think, going to be a new trend. We live in interesting times. That's the old Chinese curse, right? Certainly, from the point of view of tech, these have been very interesting times the last couple of decades. It's getting more interesting all the time, and it's coming from the power of social media, the unexpected power of social media, to elect a president, to make millions in the stock market, and perhaps threaten the entire stability of American financial markets, to go on the attack against people and groups. These are digital mobs completely fostered and created by social media networks. It was originally Twitter and Facebook, and now you've got to throw Reddit in there. Actually, Reddit's always been a player there. I like Reddit. I use Reddit all the time. Uh, I like social media in general. 
But I think it's, uh, I think we might, we might start to see, it might, you know, there's an old, I don't know if this is true or not, but you'll see this as you're going across old bridges to say, you know, break step. If you're in the, if you're in the military and you're marching, they say break step when you go over this bridge. Cause if we all march over this bridge in lockstep, we'll create resonances that could destroy the bridge. It could actually fall down. So break step as you walk over the bridge. That's what we're seeing. We're seeing these resonances, large groups of people, when they move together, very powerful. And there are the tools now, these social media networks, to make it possible. And by the way, it's hidden social media networks too, like WhatsApp and Telegram and Discord. These are messaging systems. What happens is these groups operate at first in public, but then they get scrutiny already, a lot of scrutiny against Wall Street bets. So they move to these more private messaging systems. There's still social networks. There's still maybe tens of thousands of people in a single messaging group. Same conversation, but just out of the public eye. You got to be in the know. And it's very powerful. It's, it's as if we have become an army marching in lockstep across the bridge of our democracy. And it's starting to sh starting to shake, it's starting to shake. I think this is very interesting. This is a consequence of technology that I think most of the time in, in the old days, people like me who were, you know, watching the rise of social media and the internet thought this is going to be great. This is going to be a democratizing force. Everybody's going to get a voice. It's going to, it won't, you know, be the big radio stations and TV stations and, and newspapers. It'll have all the control of of the truth of the news. Everybody will have a voice. And now it's come true. And maybe we were a little bit optimistic. Maybe, maybe, maybe there's a, maybe it's a mixed bag of uh, blessings. I don't know. What do you think? What's bad about it is people are doing things as a mob that they might not do as individuals. That worries me. Anyway, I'm glad you were here and I'm here and I'll be here next week. And I hope you'll come by and bring your friends too as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip? into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. Originating from Albany, New York, and distributed worldwide, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. Mention November 22nd to many people in the U.S., and they will immediately associate it with the date that President John F. Kennedy was assassinated. But for amateur radio operators, especially those licensed for more than 40 years, it means something totally different. Incentive licensing. In a three-stage process starting on November 22, 1967 and ending on November 22, 1969, the FCC instituted incentive licensing, ostensibly designed to encourage amateurs to upgrade, but in reality a process under which most amateurs lost up to 50% of the frequencies they usually operated. Incentive licensing, or incentive punishment as some have called it, has been blamed for the demise of many American amateur radio equipment manufacturers such as Hammerland and Halicrafters, a temporary decline in the number of licensed hams, and bitter feelings against the ARRL and the FCC that last to this day. As we approach the 40th anniversary of incentive licensing, let's take a look at the events that led up to this controversial decision. In order to do so, we must go back to 1951. Prior to 1951, a rather simple license structure existed in this country. Amateurs had a Class A, Class B, or Class C license. Class A conveyed all amateur privileges on all frequencies, including exclusive access to the 75 and 20 meter phone bands. Class A required passing a comprehensive theory exam and a 13 word per minute CW test, which included sending as well as receiving. Class B conveyed all CW privileges on all bands and allowed phone operation on 160, 11, and 10 meters in the HF spectrum and on all VHF and UHF frequencies. Note that 75 and 20 meter phone operation was limited to Class A hams. What about 40 and 15 meters? Well, 40 at that time was CW only. And as for 21 megacycles, it wasn't a ham band back then. 
15 meters was given to us in 1947 in exchange for the 14.35 to 14.4 megacycle segment of 20 meters, but the 15 meter band actually wasn't available to hams until 1952. In addition, 160 meter access was severely restricted at that time because of the Loran radio navigation and 11 meters was a secondary U.S. only allocation with limited popularity. So, the Class B ham who wanted HF phone operation went to 10 meters by default. Class B hams passed the same 13 words per minute code test as Class A, but a less comprehensive written test. Class C gave the same exact privileges as Class B, but the exam was given by mail under the supervision of a Class B or higher license to those who couldn't walk the 175 miles uphill both ways through the snow to a quarterly FCC examination point. In 1951, the FCC reorganized the entire license structure. Class A was replaced by the advanced, Class B by the general, and Class C by the conditional. Three new licenses were created at that time, the extra, technician, and novice. The extra, actually amateur extra, had a 20 words per minute code requirement and a written exam more difficult than the old Class A. In order to qualify for the extra, one needed to be licensed as a Class B or general for at least two years in addition to passing the test. However, if you held a Class B or general license or higher, and you were licensed prior to April 1917, you could get an extra with no additional test. Technicians had to pass the general theory and a five words per minute CW test. They had privileges above 220 megacycles only. Novices had a basic 20 question written exam, the five words per minute code test, and limited CW privileges on 80, 11, and two meters, as well as voice privileges on two meters. This was a one-year, non-renewable license. The advance was available until December 31, 1952 for upgrades or new licenses, at which time it was withdrawn from availability. Those holding advanced class licenses could continue to renew, but no new licenses were issued. In 1952 and 1953, the FCC also dropped a couple of other surprises. Phone operation was allowed for the first time on 40 meters, 15 meters was finally opened, the 14.35 to 14.4 megacycle segment of the 20 meter band was removed from the amateur service, and in the biggest bombshell of them all, generals, former class B, and conditionals, former class C, were given access to all former exclusive class A phone frequencies. Now the conditional, general, advanced, and extra class operators had the exact on-the-air privileges. During the 1950s, novices were given 40 and 15 meter CW privileges in addition to their 80 meter segment and 11 meters was removed. Technicians got 6 meters in 1955 and the 145 through 147 megacycle segment of 2 meters in 1959. Technicians could also hold a novice class license simultaneously. Many amateurs were unhappy with this structure. Extras complained that they had to go through a two-year waiting period as a general or advanced, had to pass a difficult test, and yet received no exclusive frequencies for their efforts. Advanced class amateurs were upset with the limbo status of their licenses, the fact that they no longer held the highest class license, and the fact that they no longer had exclusive use of 75 and 20 meter phone. General advanced and extra class amateurs complained that novices should not have been given 15 meter CW. The general advanced and extra class hams were also opposed to increasing technician class privileges for reasons we will see in our next installment. In summary, although the vast number of hams were satisfied, a small minority had complaints, and the ARRL listened. In 1963, acting on complaints they claim they received from members and operators in other countries, the ARRL proposed incentive licensing. In an editorial, the ARRL implied that perhaps it was a mistake when the Class B and Generals were given the 75 and 20 meter phone segments. The ARRL stand was now clear. Exclusive frequencies must be restored to the advanced and extra class amateurs in order to give generals an incentive to upgrade. Of course, what was left unsaid was that in order to do so, frequencies would have to be taken away from the general class hams.
What was the ARRL's original proposal? How did HAMS react to it? What was the controversy about the technician class license that was dragged to the forefront in this battle? Be on board next time for the answers. The Anadolu News Agency in Turkey reports that Levent Tane from Istanbul rediscovered amateur radio when he was suspended from his job due to the pandemic. Speaking to the agency, Levent Tame shared how an unpleasant surprise, his temporary suspension from his job as an aircrew chief and trainer with reduced salary because of the pandemic, introduced him to the unfamiliar yet exciting world of amateur radio. Levent said that after a few weeks of confusion, frustration and indecision, he determined that keeping himself busy through a hobby would be the best way to preserve his sanity. He then remembered his long-lasting interest in amateur radio. He commented, Being part of a community spread all around the world and communicating with them in not-so-common and harder ways made me feel somewhat special. Levent noted that personal experiences played a role in his interest in amateur radio. In 1999, he participated in search and rescue efforts in the aftermath of the earthquake in northwestern Turkey as a volunteer. There, he witnessed how a handful of volunteer amateur radio operators made much-needed communication possible when phone lines collapsed. In the interview, Levent underscored that the significance of the amateur radio operators was appreciated by Turkish state institutions, which learned lessons from this earthquake, and eventually they tasked radio operators into search and rescue teams of the Disaster and Emergency Management Authority. He added that encouraging people in Turkey, especially the younger generation, to take an interest in amateur radio would eventually lead to curiosity for science and hence an increased interest in engineering and natural sciences. You can read the full story at www.aa.com.tr. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a direct download on our website at www.twiar.net. It is time now for the propagation forecast. Ted Cook, K7RA in Seattle, reports that we just witnessed five days in a row with zero sunspots. But on February 2nd, a small sunspot group, number 2801, appeared on our sun's northwest limb. It soon rotated off the sun's visible area, and on February 4th, the sunspot number was back to zero. We will probably see a few more days with no sunspots, but a return after February 11th is possible when increased solar flux is forecast. The average daily sunspot numbers declined from 28.1 reported in last week's bulletin to 3.3 this week. The average daily solar flux dropped 3 points from 77.2 to 74.2. The average daily planetary A and dice went from 9.4 to 6.7. Solar flux over the next 30 days is predicted at 74 on February 6th through the 11th, 76 on February 12th through the 16th, 78 on February 17th through the 22nd, 76 on February 23rd through the 24th, 74 on February 26th, 73 on the 27th, all the way through March 1st. The planetary A in dice is 8, 16, and 10 on February 6th through the 8th, 8 on February 9th through the 10th, 5 on February 11th through the 20th, 20, 16, and 12 on February 21st through the 23rd, and 5 on February 24th through the 27th, 12 and 8 on February 28th, all the way through March 2nd. A coronal hole may return on March 20th through the 21st, causing a rising A index. Time now for the AMSAT report. AMSAT continues to assess the status of the RAD FX SAT 2 or FOX 1E amateur radio CubeSat after a ham in Nevada reported hearing his CW signal weekly via the spacecraft's transponder on January 27th. AMSAT Vice President for Engineering Jerry Buxton and Zero JY said on January 29th that the beacon still has not been heard and AMSAT is asking everybody to listen. The beacon transmits 1200 BPS BPSK telemetry on 435.750 MHz plus or minus Doppler upper sideband. 
Ever thought about receiving images from a NOAA weather satellite? It's not very hard. Dmitry Elisuev has developed a 50-line Python script that will decode the APT audio from the NOAA weather satellites and convert it to a grayscale image. Scroll down to January 29th, 2021 on www.rtl-sdr.com and you'll find the article. Sounds like a cool project to play with. The MSAT Report comes to us every week, courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. When a record number of small satellites left Earth aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket on Sunday, January 24th, France's UVSQ sat satellite carrying an FM amateur radio transponder was among them. The satellite is focusing on broadband measurements of Earth radiation budget and on solar spectral radiance in the Hertzberg continuum. Amateur radio operators are being encouraged to contact the satellite as well. Towards this end, AMSAT Francophone is providing hams with the software to receive, interpret, and upload telemetry to the AMSAT F server or the SAT NOGS database. The software runs on both Linux and Windows platforms. The satellite designed by Latmos has had its frequencies coordinated by the IARU, the San Quentin and Evelines Radio Club, F6KRK, was also involved in the project. It was among the 143 satellites carried on SpaceX's first dedicated small sat rideshare program mission, which broke the previous record of 104 simultaneous launches aboard an Indian Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle in 2017. Taiwanese space communication enthusiasts have recently seen the successful launch of two of their satellites. It hasn't been quite plain sailing in trying to make contact with the units now they're up, but encouraging signs have been coming in from amateur radio operators around the world. The Taipei Times newspaper reports that amateur radio operators have received signals transmitted by Taiwan's two new CubeSats, USAT and IdeasSat launched by SpaceX on January the 24th. In the article, the newspaper says that by noon January the 25th, the two teams had not succeeded in communicating with the CubeSats from the three ground stations at the National Space Organization, the National Central University, and the National Taiwan Ocean University. However, some overseas amateur radio operators did receive signals transmitted by the two CubeSats with corresponding signal frequencies, intervals and coordinates, said Professor Lauren Chang of the National Central University's Department of Space Science and Engineering, who oversees the IdeasSat project. It shows that the two CubeSats are operating, Chang said, adding that the researchers would continue to work on solving the signal reception problems. You can read the full story at www.taipeitimes.com and the frequencies to monitor are as follows. For USAT, 436.250 MHz using modes AX25, 9K6 and GMSK and it's the same three modes for IdeasSat, transmitting on 437.345 MHz. More information on USAT and IdeasSat can be found at www.nspo.narl.org.tw. That's www.nspo.narl.org.tw. The School Club Roundup comes but twice a year in February and October, and the February edition is upon us. The five-day event runs from Monday, February 8th at 1300 UTC to Friday, February 12th at 2359 UTC on any mode, including SSB, CW, or digital. Digital is allowed for the event, but only digital modes that support the full exchange of required contact information are permitted. The School Club Roundup participating stations may operate no more than six hours each day and no more than 24 hours over the course of the week. And remember to stay safe, especially in terms of taking pandemic precautions if operating within a group. Stations may enter in the individual, club, or school category. The on-air exchange is your call sign, a signal report, your entry class, I, C, or S, and state, province, territory, or DXCC entity. The full school club roundup exchange is to be sent and received over the air. The School Club Roundup is co-sponsored by the ARRL and the Long Island Mobile Amateur Radio Club, and results will appear in QST as well as online. 
The top three entities in each category will receive award certificates. For the complete rules, logging sheets, and other resources, you can visit the ARRL website. It looks like restoration experts at Germany's State Archaeological Museum in Schleswig-Holstein are looking at additional work. After starting the one year's desalinization and restoration work on a World War II Enigma machine found in the Baltic Sea off the northeast coast of Germany in December last year, another six units have been found. Unfortunately, many of this find have been made unusable before they were thrown into the sea from German warships at the end of the Second World War. The machines, which resemble old typewriters, have inner workings that include three interchangeable rotors used to scramble messages. These messages were then sent using Morse code to another ship or land station that had another Enigma machine to decode the message. Restored Enigma machines have been shown and operation demonstrated both at Friedrichshafen and Dayton Hamfests. Meanwhile, a special event is celebrating 100 years since the creation of the Royal Australian Air Force. A call has been put out for enthusiastic recruits to serve the Royal Australian Air Force, no, not for military duty, but to become airborne nonetheless via the radio as part of one of two special event stations marking the 100th anniversary of the Royal Australian Air Force. Hams will be using the call signs VI-100AF and VK-100AF from the 1st of March to the 29th of May for 100 days. The Air Force's actual birthday is March 31st. On that date in 1921, the Royal Australian Air Force became an independent service from the Army. It is the world's second oldest Air Force. Its roots are with the Australian Flying Corps, which sent troops during World War I to serve in the Middle East and European theaters. Activations can be done at the home QTH, at a club, or even a park or soda location. There are plans to operate from four Air Force bases as well. Time for Aussie hams to register is short. Organizers are hoping to release the roster for both call signs sometime around the 5th of February. Now celebrating our 22nd year keeping the amateur radio community informed, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. Available worldwide as a podcast from our web at www.twiar.net. Foundations of Amateur Radio When you begin your journey as a radio amateur, you're introduced to the concept of a mode. A mode is a catch-all phrase that describes a way of encoding information into radio signals. Even if you're not familiar with amateur radio, you've come across modes, though you might not have known at the time. When you tune to the AM band, you're picking a set of frequencies, but also a mode, the AM mode. When you tune to the FM band, you do a similar thing, set of frequencies, different mode, FM. The same is true when you turn on your satellite TV receiver. You're likely using a mode called DVBS. For digital TV, the mode is likely DVBT, and for digital radio, it's something like DAB or DAB+. Even when you use your mobile phone, it too is using a mode, be it CDMA, GSM, LTE, and plenty of others. Each of these modes is shared within the community, so that equipment can exchange information. Initially, many of these modes were built around voice communication, but increasingly, even the basic mobile phone modes are built around data. Today, even if you're talking on your phone, the actual information being exchanged using radio is of a digital nature. Most of these modes are pretty static. That's not to say that they don't evolve, but the speed at which that happens is pretty sedate. In contrast, a mode like Wi-Fi has seen the explosion of different versions. During the first 20 years, there were about 19 different versions of Wi-Fi. You'll recognize them as 802.11a, b, g, j, y, n, p, a, d, a, c, and plenty more. I mention Wi-Fi to illustrate just how frustrating changing a mode is for the end user. You buy a gadget, but it's not compatible with the particular Wi-Fi mode that the rest of your gear is using. It's pretty much the only end user facing mode that changes so often as to make it hard to keep up. As bad as that might be, 
there is coordination happening with standards bodies involved, making it possible to purchase the latest Wi-Fi equipment from a multitude of manufacturers. In amateur radio, there are amateur-specific modes, like RITI, PSK31, even CW is a mode. And just like with Wi-Fi, they evolve. There's RITI45, RITI50, and RITI75 wide and narrow, when you might have thought that there was only one RITI. The FL Digi software supports 18 different Olivia modes out of the box, which haven't changed for a decade or so. The speed of the evolution of Olivia is slow. The speed of the evolution of RITI is slower still. CW is not moving at all. At the other end, new amateur modes are being developed daily. The JT modes, for example, are by comparison evolving at breakneck speed, to the point where they aren't even available in the latest versions of the software. For example, FSK441, introduced in 2001, vanished at some point, superseded by a different mode, MSK144. It's hard to say exactly when this happened. I searched through 15 different releases and couldn't come up with anything more definitive than the first mention of MSK144 in version 170, apparently released in 2015. My point is that in amateur radio terms there are modes that are not changing at all, and modes that are changing so fast that research is being published after the mode has been depreciated. Mike, Whiskey Bravo 2, Foxtrot Kilo Oscar, published his research, Meteor Scatter Communication with Very Short Pings, comparing the two modes, FSK441 and MSK144, in September 2020. It makes for interesting reading. There are parallels between the introduction of computing and the process of archiving. The early 1980s saw a proliferation of hardware, software, books and processes that exploded into the community. With that came a phenomenon that lasted at least a decade, if not longer, where archives of these items don't exist, because nobody thought to keep them. Floppy disks thrown out, books shredded, magazines discarded, knowledge lost. It didn't just happen in the 1980s. Much of the information that landed man on the moon is lost. We cannot today build a Saturn V rocket with all the support systems needed to land on the moon, from scratch, even if we wanted to. We have lost manufacturing processes, the ability to decode magnetic tapes, and lost the people who did the work through retirement and death, not to mention company collapses and mergers. Today we're in the middle of a golden age of radio modes, each new mode with more features and performance. In reality this means that your radio that came with CW, AM, FM and SSP will continue to work, but if it came with a specialised mode like FSK441, you're likely to run out of friends to communicate with when the mode is depreciated in favour of something new. In my opinion, open source software and hardware is vitally important in this fast-moving field, and if we're not careful we will repeat history and lose the knowledge and skill won through perseverance and determination due to lack of documentation or depreciation by a supplier. When did you last document what you did? What will happen to that when you too become a silent key? I'm on a Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. For an amateur club in Canada, emergency response doesn't just consist of HTs, repeaters, and HF radios. Radio operators there are hoping they can soon assist local responders by getting their microwave network into the emergency response plans. The Kamloops Amateur Radio Club, which already provides emergency support on the ground throughout its region in British Columbia, sees an even more potential in their mountaintop to mountaintop broadband network. They're offering to open its use to the Thompson Nicola Regional District, a regional governing body, and the hopes that the microwave links internet connectivity and large data bandwidth can provide an additional resource for local emergency operations centers in case of wildfires and other calamities. Club President Miles, VE7FSR, said the idea of providing the TNRD with a high-level assistance, was inspired by the 2017 wildfires in the region. He and some friends in the British Columbia Wireless Amateur Radio Network recalled how the blaze had hampered the emergency operations center's abilities to communicate with vital information. Miles reported that for the region's various municipalities to utilize the club's high-speed microwave system, they'd need to first establish that they have line of sight with the mountains, and then install ditches there to connect with the EOC below. Miles said this sort of operation has come of age, 
Emergency operations centers, he said, are more dependent than ever on Internet access because of the data bandwidth, which is so much greater than there was on VHF, UHF, and especially HF. The Macon, Georgia shopping mall, known as the Shops at River Crossing, became part of a winter field day activity, and even the mall's security department got in on the action. Local hams were using the occasion to demonstrate analog and digital HF operations, as well as UHF, VHF, and D-Star. According to David Johnson, KF4ALH, Emergency Coordinator for Macon Bib Aries, this field day activity was more about scoring big points on education and public relations instead of points in a contest. Hams from Macon Bibb County Aries were joined by the Macon Bibb County EMA Volunteer Group, Macon Amateur Radio Club, the Monroe County Aries Group, and the Monroe County Amateur Radio Society. The Hams gave science lessons and history lessons along with a basic look on how amateur radio works and the role it plays when hurricanes sweep through. David said a few visitors seemed interested in learning more and doing more. He added, even if one new person gets the amateur radio bug from our event, I consider that a bonus. If you've ever given any thought to becoming a radio amateur, frankly, there's never been a better time. A resurgence in the hobby during the COVID pandemic lockdowns has allowed radio hams to reach further than their front door, and this can only be a good thing for mental health. And it has led to the evolution of online courses for the three classes of UK license. That's Foundation, Intermediate and Full, and the courses are free. A new Foundation course, the entry level, is about to begin. If you are not currently licensed, this is a fantastic opportunity, especially as the previous practical assessment of the exam is currently not being required. Here are the details. The next free Amateur Radio Foundation online training course, run by volunteers from Essex Ham, starts on February the 7th. The RSGB's introduction of online exams that can be taken at home has led to a surge in demand for free online amateur radio training courses, such as that run by Essex Ham. You can find out more about online training and register to join a course at www.essexham.co.uk and head for the training section. You are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a podcast at our website, www.twiar.net, and streamed worldwide via Spotify and iHeartMedia. In the last four segments on promoting your not-for-profit ham radio club's events, we created a public service announcement and gathered names and addresses of local media outlets. We discussed other places to post your event flyers and where to mail your PSAs. This time we'll cover some of the realities of free promotions in these days of media conglomeration and downsizing. In the good old days of broadcast radio, even the boss's secretary had a secretary. Today, radio and TV stations often operate on skeleton crews, Computers playing wave files or commanding a stack of CD changers take the place of live on the air talent. At stations which once employed 15 people now operate on five or so with many jobs contracted out or supplied by out of state ownership. This sad but real state of broadcasting has a direct effect on your ability to promote your nonprofit club's event. They simply do not have the manpower to research, verify, or prep your PSA for air. This is all the more reason why it must be ready to use as is when it arrives at the radio station. The more you do to make it ready for them, the more likely it is to be put on the air. The professional appearing PSA is also more likely to be read as is if it looks right too. If there is a fatal flaw in any of the important features in your PSA, it is always easier for the person who actually reads it on the air to simply use the next one instead. A traditional item in the broadcast studio is the PSA folder. This three-ring folder usually sits right in front of the announcer and not only contains your PSA, but also other information for the DJ. Radio stations usually use a three-ring folder with clear plastic sleeves. The announcer's time is scarce, so your PSA needs to be short, easy to read as is. It must not contain any grammar or spelling mistakes, should be double spaced, and the portion to be read on the air should be visibly obvious to the reader in an instant. An example of this would be 
that in your PSA, the portion to be actually read on the air should be the only area on that page, which is in bold text and double spaced, so it jumps out at the reader. Another trick is to use colored paper, but not the neon-like color. If all the pages in the PSA folder are white except yours, which is canary yellow, it makes it easier for the announcer to flip through the PSA folder to that page next time. You could put your PSA into a clear plastic sleeve and mail it to the radio station too. Never send a media outlet a handwritten PSA or ones that contain spelling and grammar mistakes. And always include contact information. Your club should designate a main contact person who has all the access to all the pertinent information about what is mentioned in your PSA and background information about your club, especially its nonprofit status. Retired people make the best contacts since they are usually easy to get a hold of during business hours. And my final strategy for promotional success is if your club has a good speaker, record your PSA into a solid 30 second recording and burn it onto a CD and mail it to the radio stations on your list. Again, include some free admission tickets and provide a hard copy of the PSA, which is on the CD. This is the ultimate lazy but most successful approach to promotional success. This is Greg Stoddard, Kilo Fox 9 Mike Papa, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. Here is this week's listing of upcoming ARRL Learning Network webinars. These webinars are a members only benefit, and to register, check on upcoming webinars, and to view previously recorded sessions, visit the ARRL website. Interesting stories about ham radio and weather spotting, presented by Rob Macedo, KD1CY. One of the most critical ways amateur radio supports agencies such as the National Weather Service, National Hurricane Center, and Emergency Management is through weather spotting via the NWS Skywarn program. This presentation reviews some interesting stories about how amateurs involved in Skywarn have saved lives and property and why this is an important amateur radio activity. This webinar is scheduled to be held on Thursday, February 11, 2021 at 8 p.m. Eastern or 0100 UTC on Friday, February 12th. Maxim Memorial Station W1AW Tour, hosted by W1AW Station Manager Joe Garcia and J1Q. Maxim Memorial Station W1AW, located in Newington, Connecticut, was established to honor the memory of ARRL's co-founder and first president, Hiram Percy Maxim. Although ARRL's first station was actually located in Hartford, Connecticut, and active as W1MK, W1AW in Newington is known worldwide and considered the radio station most associated with Hiram Percy Maxim. Formally established in 1938, nearly two years after the death of Hiram Percy Maxim, W1AW has consistently been on the air, save for the time when the station was ordered off the air by the FCC because of World War II. This webinar is scheduled to take place on Thursday, February 18th, 2021 at 3.30 p.m. Eastern or 2030 UTC. Talking to Astronauts, an elementary school's exciting Aries experience hosted by Diane Warner, KE8HLD. This is a story about Talmage Elementary School's participation in a once-in-a-lifetime amateur radio on the International Space Station School Contact. Learn about their amazing journey leading up to the amateur radio contact with an astronaut on the International Space Station. The excitement of the entire experience was shared not just by the students, but included faculty, parents, the community, and local amateur radio operators. You also learn how to begin the process of submitting your own ARIES contact proposal. This webinar is scheduled for Tuesday, March 2nd, 2021 at 1 p.m. Eastern or 1800 UTC. According to WSJTX software co-developer Joe Taylor, K1JT, the very popular FT8 and the other digital modes in the software suite are tools, freely available to hams who want to use them. Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, has more on this story from League Headquarters. In his words, they are very good at some things, not so good at others. Whatever your opinion, FT8 and by extension its contest mode variation FT4 have become game changers on HF, although it was initially designed for weak signal work on 6 meters. The development team did not foresee the impact FT8 would have on HF. 
Although some FT8 fans may feel the mode is running out of room on some bands, Taylor said that as far as he and his fellow WSJTX developers are concerned, the 3 kilohertz slices of spectrum suggested for FT8 use are just that, suggestions. And there is no reason why additional slices should not be used when over-occupancy requires it, he said. Band planning is best done by committees created for that purpose, he added. The FT8 watering holes are sometimes the only places to find signals on bands that otherwise might be considered dead. The WSJT development group this week announced the general availability release of WSJTX version 2.3.0. It includes a new Q65 mode. It's extremely good at that, he added, and noted that transcontinental and intercontinental DX on 6 meters has greatly benefited from the use of FT8 over the past several years. Developed in 2017, FT8 is named after its developers, Taylor and Stephen Frank, K9AN. The numeral designates the mode's 8 frequency shift keying format. Taylor said that while the development team knew that FT8 would be very useful for weak signal DXing on HF, as well as on 6 meters, it did not foresee that it would have the sort of impact it's had on HF operating. Taylor agreed that FT8 is a mature mode, with the protocol's details published in QEX. Details of message structure in particular will not change in a way that is not backward compatible, he said. A summary of new features can be found in the WSJTX 2.3 user guide. The release notes offer additional information, including a list of important program changes since the WSJ2X 2.2. Upgrading from earlier versions of WSJTX should be seamless. Installation packages for Windows, Linux, and Macintosh are available. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a stream to your favorite digital device on Spotify, TuneIn.com, Overcast, iHeartMedia, and wherever you download your podcasts. The February 6th National Contest Journal, sponsored North American Sprint on CW, and the March 13th RTTY Sprint, will begin one hour earlier at 2300 UTC instead of 0000 UTC. Both contests will end at 0259 UTC. An earlier start time gives participants in the north and east a larger window for 20-meter activity. The new start time in February and March are provisional and will be evaluated after contests. The September North American Sprint start times will not change. The log submission deadline is seven days from the end of the contest. Submit logs via the Uploader app. Preliminary score lines will be available approximately two weeks after the contest. The full online results will be published about a month later. A condensed version of the full results will then be published in the print edition of the National Contest Journal. The North American Sprint webpage includes rules, results, team registration, and other information. CW Sprinting and How to Article by Jim George, N3BB, can be found under tips at the lower right hand side of the North American Sprint webpage. If you tune around on the amateur bands, it won't be too long before you hear portable stations calling CQ SOTA. That's S-O-T-A, Sierra, Oscar, Tango, Alpha. And you may have wondered what this means. Well, Summits on the Air is a very popular facet of amateur radio. And now you can learn more from a recent presentation. A video of the talk, Getting Started with Summits on the Air, known as SOTA, was recently given by Michael Sansom, Golf Zero Papa Oscar Tango, and is now available on YouTube. SOTA rewards radio amateurs who operate from summits around the world. There are rewards for activators, those who actually ascend the summits to transmit, and chasers, who either operate from home, a local hilltop, or are even activators on other summits. SOTA is operational in nearly a hundred countries around the world. Each country has its own association, which defines the recognized SOTA summits within that association. Each summit earns the activators and chasers a score, which is related to the height of the summit. Certificates are available for various scores, leading to the prestigious Mountain Goat and Shack Sloth trophies. 
Summits on the Air has been carefully designed to make participation possible for all radio amateurs and shortwave listeners. This is not just for mountaineers. The SOTA talk was given to Berry Radio Society and the Warrington Amateur Radio Club on Tuesday, February the 2nd. It describes an exciting aspect of the hobby that combines walks and climbs with amateur radio. You can watch the video on YouTube. Go to YouTube and type in Getting Started with Summits on the Air. And the SOTA website is at sota.org.uk. The WSJT Development Group has announced the general availability release of WSJTX version 2.3.0. A summary of new features will be found on the WSJTX 2.3 user guide. The release notes offer additional information, including a list of important program changes since the WSJTX 2.2. Upgrading from earlier versions of the WSJTX should be seamless, and it's not necessary to uninstall a previous version or move any files. Installation packages for Windows, Linux, and Macintosh are available. A release candidate of WSJTX version 2.4.0 RC will be available soon. Its main new features is a mode called Q65, with unique capabilities for Earth Moon Earth and scatter propagation modes. The Military Auxiliary Radio System has announced dates in 2021 during which Mars members will operate on 60 meters for interoperability with the amateur radio community. Some dates coincide with quarterly Department of Defense Communications exercises. All exercises will begin on Channel 1 as the initial calling channel and move to other 60 meter working channels as may be appropriate. In addition to voice calls, we want to introduce passing ICS-213 messages in both voice and digital modes to enhance the overall interop experience, said U.S. Army Mars Chief Paul English, WD8DBY. Our exercises will yield the frequencies to other scheduled exercises or mission activations, which may be called by other agencies for interop support for example, hurricane, wildfire, etc. We regularly instruct Mars members to work cooperatively with the amateur radio community during the use of the 60-meter interop channels. We will continue to track our 60-meter usage and activities. English said he plans to provide a quarterly usage report of 60-meter interoperability activities. Help has finally arrived in cleaning up the space junk in Earth orbit. It's called the iodine thruster, and it hates space junk so much that it's helping prevent it using an unconventional, non-toxic propellant, iodine. The electronic thruster is being used to control a satellite's height above the Earth. That means that when a satellite reaches the end of its mission, it can be sent down into the atmosphere where it can safely burn up rather than add more dead clutter to the skies. The device has already proven its worth. It successfully changed the orbit of a commercial research nanosat that was launched last November. Arlydine is seen as an ideal propellant to use for this technology because it is solid at room temperature and pressure, becoming gas when it's heated without having to liquefy first through a process known as sublimation. It also only takes up a small space aboard the satellite. This technology isn't just for dead and dying satellites, however. Experts speculate it can help small CubeSats extend their mission lifetimes before dying because the thruster can raise the satellite's orbit if they start to drift back toward Earth. AMSAT reports that it's continuing to assess the status of the RAD FXSAT-2 FOX-1E amateur radio CubeSat after a ham in Nevada reported hearing his CW signal weekly via the spacecraft's transponder on January 27th. AMSAT Engineering and Operations was able to confirm the reports from Brad Schumacher, W5SAT, and determined that Rad FXSAT2 is partially functioning, although signals are extremely weak. We also appreciate those who joined in determining whether they could detect their own or other signals in recent passes today, AMSAT said in a January 28th bulletin. Please do not attempt to transmit through the transponder until further notice. This is very important to the next steps we are taking now. 
The next crucial step in evaluating the condition of RAD FX SAT2 is to determine whether or not the 1200 BPS BPSK telemetry beacon is operating and, if possible, to copy telemetry from the beacon. AMSAT continues to ask that those with 70 centimeter receive capability listen on the beacon frequency of 435.750 MHz plus or minus Doppler upper sideband. Use Fox Telem to capture any telemetry and set Fox Telem to upload to server so that AMSAT will receive the telemetry data. Recordings are welcome with detailed description. AMSAT stressed that keeping the RAD FXSAT2 FOX1E transponder clear is essential to putting all power and attention to the beacon telemetry. Available data suggests that RAD FXSAT2 is Object M from the Virgin Orbit Launcher 1 launch, NORAD ID 47320, International Designation 21-002M. We thank the amateur satellite community for their perseverance and assistance while the AMSAT engineering and operations teams work to understand and resolve the situation with RAD FXSAT2, AMSAT said. This Week in Amateur Radio is holding open auditions for news anchors for the weekly National Worldwide Amateur Radio News Service. If you have a good radio voice and can reliably read provided news copy, we are looking for you. This, of course, is an all-volunteer position, and amateur radio license is not required. You must have a high-quality microphone, headset mics are not used, and be familiar with audio editing software to record and edit your finished news stories before uploading. If you would like to try out for a weekly or bi-weekly anchor position with North America's premier amateur radio news on air and podcast, please send an email to our producer, George, W2XBS. You can include a sample MP3 of yourself reading news copies sent as an attachment to W2XBS77 at gmail.com. That's whiskey, the number two, X-Ray Bravo Sierra 77 at gmail.com. Be sure and use Anchor Audition in the subject line. Please include your phone number and a good window of time for a callback to discuss your submission and our operating logistics to see if This Week in Amateur Radio is a good fit for you. We hope to hear from you soon. And finally this week, amateur radio operators in India are being credited with helping make an important contact in Australia, but the communication here has nothing to do with DXing. A man who had been found wandering disoriented on the streets of Kolkata, India several weeks ago has been identified as an Australian citizen with the help of local amateur radio operators. According to a report in the Times of India, the 69-year-old man, who is of Indian origin, is from Sydney, Australia. He has been in one of the local state-run hospitals since he was found. The West Bengal Amateur Radio Club intervened at the request of local health department officials who wanted the man's family located and knew the club has a long track record of helping reunite families. Ambarish Nag Biswas, VU2JFA, club secretary, said that although there were still many missing details, Paperwork found in the man's possession indicated he was residing in Sydney but had formerly owned property in India. The newspaper report said the man speaks English but appears to have some kind of mental disorder. The Australian Deputy High Commissioner's office in Kolkata told the newspaper that efforts are underway to contact his family members. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters around the country and around the world on great repeater systems like WA3PBD repeater system on Thursday evenings at 7.30 p.m. on 146.730 and 223.940, covering all of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and beyond. Many of the news and information items heard on This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Letter, the AWRL Audio News, the Southgate Amateur Radio News Service, Southgate Vibes, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, 
the Radio Society of Great Britain and Ofcom, the SARL, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated. Now for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73 until next week. This Week in Amateur Radio is copyright Community Video Associates Incorporated. All rights reserved.